got. Yeah, so he was a step. Yeah, son. she had control over him, and she, that series portrays her as demonic, right? Poisoning every, every. I mean, he's portrayed as a total like uh, uh, not a loser, but someone who is completely henpecked. He doesn't know what's going on half the time. And uh, she's just poisoning all the people he actually loves, people who are actually related to him, to make way for her, uh, uh, her uh, vile offspring to succeed. And she succeeds. And it's done in the name of Claudius, who is one of Augustus's actual relatives, not through her, but through, uh, I think, his daughter or something. In any case, uh, they call him Caca Claudius because they show him as a simpleton. That he uh, was known to be uh, have a club foot or something like that, and uh, he couldn't, you know, he had he, he, he had a limp when he walked. And so it, it, it portrays him as um, purposely looking like he was no threat, so she wouldn't eliminate him. And he succeeds in that. And that's why they do it through his eyes because uh, he succeeds in surviving all her because he acts like nobody would ever want to make him emperor. And when he becomes emperor, he actually becomes the most sympathetic emperor of all for a while until he too gets henpecked. What's his fate, do you know? Uh, he has this wife who's again uh, not his, the mother of his children, the mother of Nero. And she wants Nero to become the next emperor. I forget what her name is. Um, what's her name? Messaline. Messaline, thanks. Really good. Yeah, Messaline. Anyway, she was reputed to have com <laughs> competed with the prostitutes yeah. in the brothels and beat them at their game, according to the... But the Romans loved to write gossip. You'll find this in works by Suetonius. In any event, uh, she ultimately got him, uh, poisoned him, or did something to him, and, you know, he, he was done in in the end and made way for Nero. And Nero's gr gratitude to his, his mother was what? He had his mother sunk in a ship when she was going to some island or something like that. And I think she survived that sinking and then he went out and had her drowned anyway. <laughs> I should laugh. These are really, <laughs> these are really nice, nice people. This is why the revolt in Palestine occurred. It occurred in Nero's reign. You know, here are these, pure, call the Jews, whatever you want to call them, various parties. They're totally puritanical. They're like, wouldn't even look on naked flesh without like covering over. They had a horror of menstrual cycles and things of that kind of thing. You know, these, these are people that you know haven't got a clue about sex at all. You know, and 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 run a mile when they see it. And here are these totally lascivious and licentious and depraved Roman officials and emperors ruling. Them. Well, it sent them into paroxysms of uh, frustration and anger until finally it all broke out in 66 with this, with this uh, doomed revolt against the might of Rome. And yet they all eagerly ran into it. And uh, Christianity was the product of that. <coughs> that doomed revolt paved the way for the survival of Christianity, the more peaceful messianism. So you have to understand, this was a messianic revolt. So when that was doomed, the more accommodating messianism went through. You say, well, wasn't there a more accommodating messianism? That's the whole subject of my book, the New Testament Code. You'll have to decide that. I don't think there was one. Because I don't think more accommodating messianists get crucified. You know, so in fact, someone had to explain away the crucifixion of Jesus. That's what the Gospels are about. To present Jesus as a representative of the more peaceful messianism and his crucifixion having something to do with the perfidity of the Jews. That's really what the authors have in mind. Now, did it happen? That's the question for you, the jury, to decide. That's what the historical Jesus is all about. You've only got two or three Jesuses you can have. You can have a militant, apocalyptic, revolutionary Jesus. You can have a pro Pax Romanum, accommodating Jesus who advocates paying taxes in Rome and so on and so forth. Or you're going to have somewhere in the middle. And then, you know, I don't want to pass judgment on that, but you know I have in my mind. But I, I'm fair, I don't want you to necessarily follow me, so I've said that enough times. You, uh, 
you do understand. So in any case, um, the rabbis in this particular episode, I got back, I usually saw myself off and don't get back, but this time I did. The rabbis in this particular episode with a grip of one, why is a grip of one crying? They all yell out three times, like three times the cock crows in the, in the gospel portraits of the crowd of Jesus. They all cry out, you are one of us, you are one of us, you are one of us, and that's in the Talmud. Very important, I think, historical episode in the Talmud. Why is he crying? Agrippa one, the one portrayed in uh, I got back where I started in uh, in I Claudius as Herod. Why is he crying? And uh, why do they cry out? You are one of them. In the context of what I just talked. About. Nobody knows. Because he realizes they see him as a foreigner. That he shouldn't be king. He reads the Deuteronomic king law. When he comes to the passage, you shall not put a foreigner over you, he cries. Because he knows he shouldn't be reading the passage. And it, it, it actually delegitimatizes him. And yet they're allowing him to read the passage. And so he cries. And then they comfort him and say, stop crying, Agrippa. You are one of us. You are one of us. You are one of us. We don't see you as a foreigner. We don't see you as a foreigner. We don't see you as a foreigner. Okay? And I told you he was the most accommodating Herodian. All the rest were pretty horrific. But, you know, in terms of Palestinian life, community, and national uh, feeling, identity. Uh, okay, so the Pharisees uh, then are seeking accommodation with the powers that be then and even today. Rabbinic Judaism, you may or may not know, are the descendants of the Pharisee party. The Talmud is the legacy of the Pharisee party. How come? How come? What happened to all these other parties? They're so rich in this prayer that we have here. Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots, Sikhari. Where did they all go? How come now all Jews are one or another kind of Pharisee? And therefore, perfect thing for Christianity to beat, to, to, to beat up on. The, the, the Jews are like blind men falling into, you know, punch drunk fighter falling into the next, falling into the next punch. They have no idea where the blows are coming from and why, because they don't know what they've done to, plus they accept all the stories about them, they accept all the gospel stories about them, because they assume they all must be... Uh,